As always, I do encourage you to grab a devotional book uh, on your way out or when you come in the way in and uh, to take those and to go through those and study those, uh, just directing you to the Word of God. And uh, the Word of God is so powerful and so important. And, uh, and so that's why I write those to help just direct you, to help you think through the passages that you're reading. Several years ago, a famous boxer, Muhammad Ali, passed away. Now, he was before my time. Uh, when I start, was growing up, I would hear about him, but it was always a reference to what had been or who had been one of the greatest boxers. I know very little about him. The only thing I remember seeing video clips of him often saying is, I am the greatest. Now, that always baffled my mind because when I knew Muhammad Ali growing up, I always had the picture of some guy who just stood there and just shook all the time because of his Parkinson's disease. And it kind of baffled my mind as a young kid how this person could claim to be the greatest where he could stand and barely control his motions. And I thought how interesting that is, that here is a man who at one time is just constantly claiming and known his claim to fame is being the greatest and spends many of the last years of his life unable to really control many of his actions. When I was a college student and first got to college, I tried out for the soccer team. I remember one of the first things our, our coach told us, it was a Christian college, and he says, I don't ever want any of you players to hold up your hands and say, we're number one, because there's always going to be somebody better than you. And that really kind of stuck out to me. I had gone to a small Christian private school, and we were a pretty good team. In fact, my senior year, our soccer team, we went undefeated. Uh, won our state championship for our league, went on to like a national type of thing and won that. And so in our minds, it's like, well, we are number one. But I didn't realize I was just part of this little small Christian school. And if we played a really a good team, we would have just been crushed. And sometimes in their mind, it's easy to think that we are better than we really are. And one of the constant themes throughout Scripture is the need for humility. Because it is one of the constant struggles that every single one of us struggle with, and that is pride. Thinking of ourselves better than we ought to think. And Paul addresses this here in Philippians chapter 2 and really gives us a tremendous challenge to practically live by each and every day. He starts here in verse 1 and says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any partic participation of spirit, any affection and sympathy. Well, he ended chapter 1 talking about how they should rejoice with him because even though he was in jail, it was part of God's plan. And now he says, look, if you want to be an encouragement to me while I'm in jail, if you want to show love to me while I'm in jail, this is one of the best things you can do. So he starts kind of to brings it up. Okay, if you really want to love me and show appreciation to me, here is what I want you to do. Verse 2, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord in one mind. What he then describes that we need to do is to humble ourselves and let Christ work through us. And part of this humility is to have the same mind. Now he's specifically speaking to the church. He says, I want you to get on the same page, to have the same purpose. Now, he's not saying, I want you all to think exactly alike. I want you all to be mirror images of each other. That's not what he's saying. We all have our different opinions. For instance, this week, I, I, I had the opportunity, it came up, that there were church 
chairs um, for $8 a piece. And so that could have maybe replaced the pews here in the church. And kind of we were talking about redecorating and upgrading. And I thought, boy, it'd be nice to have chairs. I don't have to sit in them, but be, you know, instead of the hard back, it'd be a soft back. And so I thought about getting these chairs. But I wasn't sure exactly, you know, is, uh, is anybody going to like the chairs? Are we not going to like them? Would we rather have the pews? Because the pews are, you know, fit kind of the old-fashioned look. And the chairs are new. Should we not have it? The last church I was at, they talked about chairs once, and it almost caused the church split. And I don't know if I want, I mean, it's a great deal. And I thought, my wife said, hey, get the chairs. They look great. I talked to Marilyn. She says they look great. But you know what? I presented to my family, and my 16-year-old daughter says, I love the pews. I mean, that's just kind of bizarre, you know? It's like, what do you mean? You don't want to, no, no, we should keep the pews. And then I thought, well, I don't know. I thought, well, I told the guy, I said, look, I'll talk to the church on Sunday to see what they think. And then like an hour later, he says, oh, somebody else already bought them. So I guess that's the answer. Um, so yeah, Paul's, Paul's like, oh, good. Now we can keep the pews. Other people are like saying, I wish I had the chairs. You know, we're all going to have a preference about a lot of things in life. What are we going to like? What are we not going to like? Um, you probably experienced this. My wife and I just got a new bed for our bedroom. And I really like it and think it's comfortable. And for the first several days, she couldn't sleep on it because it was too hard. And to adjust, and we have completely different tastes about things. He's not saying think exactly alike. He is saying be of the same mind, which pictures we are going to live for the same purpose. And because we're focused on the same purpose, we're going to be willing to give up some of our selfish desires, our selfish likes and dislikes in order for a greater purpose. And this is what it means by being on the same mind. The best picture we would have in our analogy today is the idea of a team. A team that everybody is willing to help and encourage one another for the same goal and goes very far and accomplishes great thing because they're not because they're all alike. Or all think exactly the same, but they have that same purpose. And here he says, look, you can fulfill my love by living all with the same mind. The same purpose to bring glory to God. To exalt Jesus Christ. To let the world know who Jesus is. And then he tells us how to do that. And he describes how we need to live a life of humility. Verse 3 says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. He says, don't do things that you know are going to cause strife or going to cause problems or going to cause arguments. Many of you understand this if you have children, that sometimes children tend to do things to their siblings, especially when they're younger, that are going to cause problems. And you as a parent says, don't start. When they get older, they don't do things to their siblings. They actually kind of do things to their mom and dad when they get older. They throw out little jabs, and I get this at my house. I'm very laid back. I'm a very laid back person who doesn't get bothered. My wife, on the other hand, she just loves the kids so much. She's so concerned about them that if they say one thing, even in joking, sometimes she all of a sudden like, gets bothered by it. She's, she's learning how to relax by this. Uh, through this but sometimes it's like you know what just stop it you know stop doing that to your mother because you know that when you say that it just gets her nerves up and bothers her it says let's do nothing out of strife things that are going to cause problems let's not do that let's not bring it up there's certain subjects and topics that maybe you've battled about before. Maybe you've come to the point that the both of you disagree on that subject and you're not going to change one another's mind. So therefore, why choose to continue to bring it up? But yet it's amazing how many times we do. Because we want to show that we're right, though they think they're right. We just want to keep giving these stabs 
And no matter how much you believe deeply about it, sometimes it's best not to bring it up because it's going to cause strife. And he says, let nothing be done through strife. Things that you know are going to cause strife. Now, I'm not talking about if there's some sin that needs to be confronted. But when you've discussed something and there's this disagreement and you know you both have this and you've kind of come to that conclusion, don't do things that continually bring things up to cause strife. Or he says, vain glory. Don't do it just because of your selfish glory. Don't do things in order so you can be lifted up because of your pride, because what you want done, or because of your way. He says, let nothing be done that way, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than themselves. He says, we need to have this lowliness of mind. The idea is uh, to make our minds low. In a sense, to realize that we are not better than the people around us. In fact, what I want to do is I want to esteem others better than me. This isn't a selfish thing like, oh, I'm just no good. Everybody's better than me. That's not the picture he gives here. It's the choice to say, I'm going to put somebody else's ideas, somebody else's concerns, somebody else's feelings, somebody else's likes or dislikes, I'm going to put those in front of my own. Now this is hard to do. Because we are naturally selfish people who naturally want our ways. And of course, our ways are always best, aren't they? I mean, right. I mean, my way, why would we want to do it another way? Because my way's best. And so here he challenges us, look, choose to do it somebody else's way. Choose to esteem them better than yourself. Verse 4, look not every man on his own things. Don't focus on your own things, but every man also on the things of others. This is a key to tremendous success in any relationship, whether it is a church relationship a marriage relationship, a work relationship, if you have every partner or everyone involved concerned about what everybody else wants and trying to please them in the sense of trying to help them or do things that they love and and everybody, every party involved is doing that, what you're going to have is you're going to have an amazing experience. I've coached teams for years, specifically soccer teams, and one thing I've always found is when a team starts to kind of yell at each other, normally I know that our team has a very good chance to win. Because when that team starts to yell at each other, you can tell that they're all in it for themselves and what they want, rather than encouraging one another. When I face a team that is very self-controlled and they encourage one another and lift one another up, I know that we're often in for a big fight. Because there's something about that unity of working together. When a marital couple is simply concerned about, I want to do what's pleasing to that other person. I want to do what is best for them. And that's continually on our minds. And if it happens with both spouses working together, it produces an amazing marriage. It produces an amazing friendship. It produces really an amazing church in unity when our concern is not to get our own way, but the concerns about what other people think and care about. Now this doesn't mean some people, some personalities are controlled by everybody else. It's not about being controlled by somebody else. Because there are people that will take this to the extreme. They know that you're loving and caring and kind and they'll take advantage of that. That's not what Paul's referring to. It's the idea of choosing, I'm willing to give up my desires, my thoughts, my preferences for the good of somebody else and for the good of the cause of Christ. And he sets and shows us the prime example of this, and that's Jesus Christ. And in order to set that, we need to conform our minds to the mind of Christ. Verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Basically, he says, 
Think like Christ. Many of you have heard of uh, the FBI profilers or state police profilers. And in general, they are quite accurate at times. Their goal is they want to try to get into the mind of the criminal and think like the criminal to help solve the problem of who the criminal is. There's been many TV shows made up about this. The idea is to try to think like that person in order to solve the problem. Here he says, I want you to think like Christ in the matter when it comes to relationships with others. So how did Christ think? Well, we see first of all that he humbled himself. Verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. It says, though he was in the form of God, he was God. Jesus existed with God, not we would say in heaven, but not just in heaven. He had the ability to be everywhere at once, to be omnipresent, omniscient. He was God. But it says he didn't hold on to his own desires. He said he didn't count it as something to be grasped. And I mentioned to you earlier that Brandon and I went out to South to Island. And the thing that I kept thinking about was about 20 years ago. Well, it's probably more than that. About 25 years ago, uh, my mom and dad took Jen and I. It was our first year. I think we were married. They took us out to the island on the ferry. And that day was a really windy day. And I remember riding in that ferry boat. If you've ever ridden that ferry or another ferry and it's been rough seas, I remember there were times where on Lake Michigan, pretty big swells. And I remember we would go up on top and you see a lot. And all of a sudden you go down in a swell and all you see is water around you. And then the water would splash on the side of the boat and you'd have to lift your feet up because the water would come there. And I remember my mom was terrified. She held onto this bar in front of her so tight because she was so afraid of what was going to happen and, and we weren't even scared because we were just laughing at her the whole time because she was terrified for this hour and 15 minute ride just barely and I think she had to go for a nap afterwards she was so tired from the energy she used and that's what I was thinking about when we were out in this little boat you know and, and the water there was it wasn't near as bad of waves as, as it was that day and I pictured that idea of holding on for dear life the idea of grasping something. And it says here that Jesus didn't view the idea of God as something he needed to hang on to. He willingly chose to give up his abilities as God in the sense to be omniscient and, and to be all-powerful and to come down to this earth. He was willing to do this. Verse 7. He emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant and being born in likeness of man. So he chose to let go of his abilities as God to be born as a baby, to be subjected and controlled and taken care of by a simple uh, family. Understand it. He gave up all his abilities as God. At that time, yes, we know that on the earth he, he did have some things, but to come as a baby, he couldn't do anything. He was helpless. He chose not to hang on to that. Why? For the good of all mankind. And he's setting the prime example. So often we cling or we hold on to our opinions so tightly that we destroy relationships. Because we're not willing to give up our own little desires, even if we think we're 100% right, rather than simply to say, I'm going to drop it, leave it alone, or I'm going to choose to do what you want to do rather than what I want. And we cling to these things, but Jesus set the prime example by letting go. He was willing to do that to empty himself. It would be kind of, uh, I, I don't even think this would be comparable, but get the idea of you being willing to move out of your house and to basically to, instead of living in your house, you're going to camp. 
but you're going to spend all your time camping and you're going to let some stranger live in your house. Now, my family think, well, that's what we're doing. We, we, for si we, we occasionally, for extra income, like starting tomorrow for a whole week, we're renting our house out to somebody for extra income and we're living at the campground. Now, I will say our campground does have a shower, a heated shower, and we have flush toilets, we have cabins, so it's really not roughing it. I, I think it's pretty easy. But my family doesn't think it's as easy as I do, but, but for a week, we're going to do that. Now, imagine, though, if we weren't getting paid to that, we just find some stranger off the street, said, here, you live in our house, and we're going to end up living out in the woods even throughout the wintertime. Well, now, that'd be pretty miserable willing to give up what you have in order to be live in this existence god gave up heaven to live among sinful man why because he loved us he set the prime example and then he gave his life for others he gave his life for us verse 8 and being found in human form he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. Now it says here, even the death of the cross. This was one of the most terrible ways to die. Jesus not only chose to give up. Now we're giving up our house for a week, but we're making some pretty good money in exchange. So it's not like we're giving up for nothing, and we're living kind of in some, some okay. We have nice beds, showers, all that. It's not much. We're giving up. Now, Jesus, when he gave up godhood, not only gave up this, this abilities as God, but he came down to die, to suffer, and die this terrible death. He set the example that we could never really mimic or follow, but we can have the same mind to be willing to love other people so much that we're willing to give up these desires that we hang on to so tightly. But the end result is that we will be exalted by God when we humble ourselves. Verse 9. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because Jesus was willing to humble himself, Jesus was then in turn exalted. This is the message that Jesus preached. Humble yourselves and let God lift you up. Says it in the book of James. Jesus himself talked to many of the disciples. If you want to be the greatest, be a servant. Let God exalt you. Proverbs are filled with ideas uh, the idea of humility and let others exalt you and not praise yourself with your own lips. When you choose to humble yourself for the good of others, the sake of the body of Christ, the sake of this relationship, when you choose to give of yourself, what's going to happen is God will be exalted and God will also exalt you. Now that's going to look differently in different times, but you will reap the benefits. This is so hard in a world that's all about self-promotion. The world is always about you got to show who you are. And our younger generation even more and more is filled with you want to put yourself online and you want your online presence for people to look at you and be in awe of you of the video you post and the picture you post of yourself and all these things about exalting who you are promoting yourself that's not what jesus says that's not how jesus lived in fact when jesus performed miracles what did he tell him to do hey don't tell anybody don't tell anybody you see jesus wasn't seeking earthly fame but in the end, Jesus was exalted. Paul says, look, this is how you can fulfill my love if you humble yourself. Put others' needs in front of your own. Now we see Roman numeral number three, that living for Christ takes work. Living for Christ takes work. Letter A, 
we need to work out spiritually. Verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, he doesn't say work to become saved. He says work out your salvation. This is a picture of the idea. If you want to get stronger physically, you work out. You strengthen your body. You exercise it. If you want to work, get stronger spiritually, you have to put it into practice. And when you choose to put the effort in, God will bring the change. Verse 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. You have a part and God has a part. You put the effort in and God will produce the results. And then we see Roman numeral number four. That rejoicing should characterize our lives. Ultimately, we need to stop complaining. I found myself just yesterday wanting to complain about something while I was preparing my sermon. I was right in the middle of preparing this. And I wanted to, I was texting somebody, I wanted to complain about something. And all of a sudden I stopped. Actually, I didn't stop. I texted the whole thing out and I was about to hit send and I said, I am complaining, and I shouldn't do this. And I just deleted that whole text and realized, you know what? I need to rejoice. And here he says in verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Uh, other things, uh, complaining or arguing are other words. Without fighting or whining are other translations used. Do all of these things in life, understanding how that you may be blameless children of God without blemish in the middle of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain he says instead of complaining rejoice he talks often about rejoicing. Do all things without complaining. When you do, you shine as a light in the world because that's what everybody else does. And ultimately what ha needs to happen is our life needs to be lived as a sacrifice. Verse 17. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering on the sac sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice for you all. Paul had every reason to complain. He had been in captivity for at least two years, probably at this time, three, four, five, six years. He'd been in prison waiting to hear uh, for C or waiting for his trial for Caesar. He uh, hadn't been treated fairly at times. He had every reason to complain. And yet he's telling everybody else, don't complain, rejoice. Even if I have to suffer for Jesus Christ, I'm willing to do that because I trust that God is in control. And then he closes by saying, simply rejoice. Verse 18. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul's circumstances in life were pretty terrible. And so what is he doing? Hey, rejoice with me. Why? Because we have a God who loves us, who sent Jesus Christ for us. We have a God who has a home in heaven waiting for us. And this earth is just temporary. Live for Him and rejoice. In conclusion, I want you to ask yourself these questions first. Are you willing to humble yourself? Second, are you thinking like Christ? Are you willing to let go of the things you hold so dearly for, for the good of others or for the sake of the cause of Christ? Thirdly, are you working out your salvation? Are you putting it into practice, the things you've learned? And lastly, does rejoicing characterize your life? Do people look at you as a complainer or do they look at you as somebody who rejoices? By the way, my experience in life has been found that who you are now, the older and older you get, it starts to just get exemplified. So if you're a rejoicer now, when you get older and older, you will find yourself rejoicing. If you're a complainer now, when you get older and older, it just gets worse. I, I mean, I've seen that many times because when we get older, we realize this. You kind of lose your thoughts or fear of everything else, and you just state what's on your mind. You kind of... 
You don't care. You're old enough. You've gone through it. You don't care what other people think. And if you've spent your whole life complaining, it just gets worse and worse. And you know what? If you're at the point to say, well, how come nobody ever visits me? How come nobody ever comes by me? You know, there's some reasons, and sometimes it's because all we do is complain. I know there are people, I, oh, I've got to go visit them, and I'm going to go there. And they're, all they're going to do is complain about everything that's wrong. And other people, it's like you go there, and you're just uplifted, even though they're stuck in their house in a miserable condition. And the key is, no matter what situation you're in life right now, choose to rejoice. I want everyone to bow your heads, close your eyes. Before we sing our final song, I'm going to ask you just to let God speak to your heart and mind here this morning.